Hi YouTube, it's Ashley here. Today we're going to be making a simplified version of this dynamic motion smear effect in Blender using the new 3.6 Geometry Node simulation system. I'm not going to be going into the full detail of how this works, but I am going to be showing you the core principles and hopefully set you up with the knowledge and a couple of ideas for how you might improve this and expand upon this for your own animations so that you too can have cool comic book uh, cartoon style motion smears. Alright, let's jump in. So the first thing we're going to do in our new project is select our default cube and send that thing straight to hell. Then add in our good old friend Suzanne the monkey and give her a couple levels of subdivision so that we have enough topology to work with so the effect is actually visible. If you add a cube, it won't work. Then go into Geometry Nodes, add your new Geometry Nodes group, and give it a memorable name so that you know what this node group is when you go to append it to another file. And now before we actually do anything, we want to give it some animation. So I'm going to turn on Auto Keyframe and just press play and give her some slow movements and also some fast movements because this is a dynamic effect that will trigger based on the velocity of the object. And then move her back to the origin at the end and turn off the auto keyframe and she should just loop around forever. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is add in our simulation zone, pressing Shift A, adding in simulation, simulation zone, then pipe your geometry in and pipe your geometry out. I'm going to go ahead and expand this to give myself a little bit of breathing room. Things get a little cramped sometimes in these simulation zones. So velocity is basically how far you've traveled over some period of time. And we can give an example here. Say this is zero and the time is equal to one. And then over here we have this is three and the time is equal to two then we know in one unit of time we have traveled three units. So our velocity would be three units per frame. So to actually implement this, we are going to use the self object node and pipe that into a object info node, which will give us the location. I'm going to reroute this and then put that into a node group because we're going to use it like three times. And give it a friendly name, like something maybe get current location. So then we're going to pipe that into the simulation input. Otherwise, our last location will be zero, and maybe our object's not at zero when it starts. Then we're going to duplicate that, add a subtract node, and then subtract the location at the current moment in time from the location at the last moment in time, which is what we just discussed. If you click the simulation input node, then over on your right, under simulation state, it will expose all the input sockets and you can rename them. I'm going to give these two nodes a frame to organize them and call this Calculate Current Velocity. So next we're going to hook these variables up to the simulation output so that they persist between frames. First I'm going to add a mix node, then I'm going to duplicate this Get Current Location node and plug that into the last position so that we update it and then we're going to connect the mix node out and then connect that newly created input into the mix node. So now this means that every frame we are blending 50-50 between the current velocity and the last velocity. I'm going to organize this real quick and then again if you select the simulation node over here on the right you can rename your variable and I'm going to rename this to current velocity just for clarity. So now that we have that done, we can preview our velocity output of the simulation, and you can see that when the object moves faster, the color gets brighter, and when it's slower, it's darker, and when it's not moving, it's totally black. So this is working. So now, in order to actually select certain parts of the mesh that we want to distort and displace, we're going to need to use something called the dot product. So let's talk about the dot product. The dot product just tells us how similar two vectors are, two arrows in space, um, if they're pointing in the same direction or pointing in the opposite direction, or if they're pointing at a right angle to each other. It's a very, very useful um, mathematical function. So if you imagine this being the motion vector and that being a dividing line, 
the dot product will be minus 1 and plus 1, depending on if it's facing or not facing, and 90 degrees will be 0. So the output of the mix node, we are going to normalize that so that it's always between 0 and 1, regardless of the velocity, and then plug that into the dot product. And then also, we're going to take the dot product of that vector and the normal of the surface, which is the direction the surface is facing. And you can see here that that's working. When the object moves, the part of it that is in the direction of motion, facing in the direction of motion, is white, and the part that's facing opposite is black. And we're going to then pipe that into the simulation output so that that value can persist between frames. And we're going to give that a name, like velocity dot product, or surface normal velocity dot, or face forward, whatever you want um, that helps you understand what's going on here. I think I change it to face forward later on in the video. But yeah, so that's pretty much it for the simulation zone. I'm going to go ahead and organize these nodes a little bit, and then we're going to continue on to the displacement part of the effect. It may be helpful for you to add frames to this with some descriptions of what things are, just so that you have a better intuition of what's going on and you don't get lost in your node groups later, because that's something that happens to me a lot. When I don't label things and don't put frames on things, I will get lost in the nodes and have no idea what's going on. So now we've calculated everything we need to calculate in the simulation, and we have all the information needed to make the rest of the effect. So I'm going to give myself some breathing room here again, and we're going to get started on the second part of it. Next, we're going to use our face forward or velocity normal dot product value as a way to limit the effect of the smear to only the parts of the object that are facing backwards. So remember, our motion vector is in some direction, and then anything aligned with it will be plus 1, opposite alignment will be minus 1, 90 degrees is 0, and these numbers will vary smoothly between negative 1 and 1. So we will set our minimum to negative 1, because we definitely want smears there. And our maximum we're going to add as a group input, because this is a good control to expose in the modifier. And I'm going to give this a name like smear cutoff. Switch our min and max so that we have 1 to 0 instead of 0 to 1. And then I'm going to preview this value and go into the modifier properties and set it to like negative 0.5. That's what we're looking for. Now you can see, as I adjust this, we can get more or less of the mesh selected, and that will help us control the threshold of our effect so that the whole thing isn't getting distorted. Negative 0.5 is a good default. I'm going to add a label to this and call this Face Forward Threshold. Then we're going to get our velocity, and we're going to normalize that so that we get a vector facing in the same direction that is of a length of 1. And then we are going to scale that by negative 1 to invert it, so that we have a vector that's facing in the opposite direction, our inverse motion vector. The next step is to add another vector scale and drag in our face forward threshold and then pipe that into a set position and we're going to put that not into the selection but the offset and now you can see the effect is beginning to take shape but unfortunately it's always at its maximum amount no matter how fast or slow the object moves it is just always being displaced and that's definitely not what we want so the next step is to find a way to scale down this displacement depending on the velocity since we already have a velocity we're ready to go all we have to do is add in another math node. So we'll take our velocity and plug that into a length math node, which will give us one single number that is the length of, or it's like our speed essentially. And then we'll put that into a map range node and add three group inputs to from min, from max, and to max. And these are going to be our trigger velocity peak velocity, and smear length, respectively. Then we will drag that and make a multiply node, and then put that between those two. Now when we press play, you can see as the object moves faster, the trail gets longer, and when it slows down, the trail shrinks to nothing. 
so these three parameters already offer us a lot of control. If I adjust the peak velocity and the trigger velocity, I'll show you what that looks like. If I pause that and run the simulation back and forth, you can see there's a high speed movement. We get full smear. And in a position where there's low movement, low speed movements get no smear. So this is really useful, and you'll want to adjust these according to your animation because some things move faster than others. I'm going to give this a node label and call this velocity based smear length. Then we're going to give ourselves a little bit more breathing room here. The next step is add in another multiply node. And this time we are going to add the actual uh, noise texture that makes the displacement be little trails instead of one big blob. So I'm going to add a Voronoi texture, and I'm going to set that in smooth F1. I'm going to preview this here so you can see. This is kind of a weird effect, so Smooth F1 gives us a little bit of a better result. And I will plug that into a color ramp, and I will plug the color ramp into that multiply node. And I can adjust these values to crunch that noise texture so that only the centers of the Voronoi cells are white. And if I turn this off, you can see here that that adds the nice little pointy smears that we like. And if you go down and adjust the color ramp, you can change how uh, bulky they are. You can make them more or less pointy. And you can also change the scale of the Voronoi texture so that you get more or less individual smears. And again, this will be limited by the density of your topology on your object. If you're doing something really low poly, don't expect there to be this much detail. We will add a group input to that and call that smear noise scale. And so yeah, that's pretty much it. That's the whole effect. Um, there's a lot more you can add here. You could add, for example, different types of noise textures. You could even animate the noise texture so that the smears change over time instead of just being the same every time the object moves. But I hope you learned something. I hope you found this tutorial useful. And if you did, you know, I'd really appreciate your support, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all those good things. And even if you didn't, um, go ahead and leave a comment and let me know what you didn't like, was it confusing, um, you know, whatever. Because this is my first tutorial and I would definitely like to make more in the future, and your feedback is greatly appreciated. So yeah, have a great day and happy blending!